everybody. Welcome back from your break. Do you feel refreshed? Yeah? All coffeeed up? My name is Alex, and uh, some of you may know me from, from years past. We've uh, been in Kelowna for the last seven years, but uh, some of you I'm probably fairly new for, or most of you here are probably new since then. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I used to be a blacksmith for about 15 years. I was a full-time blacksmith who made stuff out of wrought iron, big artistic stuff, big uh, gates and fancy stuff that I can't, can't afford myself. And, uh, and so in that job, one of my primary things was I would apprentice people. That's one of those standard things that goes on in a trades job like that. And, uh, and now, I apprentice people in a completely different way. Right now, I work with people who want to start weird church ideas. So we go into pubs and in backyards and uh, wherever you can imagine, if you want to be able to do church in a way that you're doing community with each other, that you're following after Jesus, and then you are doing something in the community, then we, if, as long as those things are happening, we can find a way to make church happen. And so in that, one of my primary things is I, I'm, again, I'm apprenticing people. I am working with people to build them up in the things that they're called to do. And so that's a little bit about, about me. How, who are you? I'm Sheldon. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't have as big of a story as him, but by day I'm an electrician. I like to show people their potential. Maybe? It's oh, a- okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I like do a lot of uh, servicey work with electrical. I wire houses and stuff like that. And by night, I'm a youth leader. Uh, I, I'm one of the team leads here with Gravity Youth in Connect. And that's pretty much all I got to say. I don't have, like I said, I don't have as big of a story as Alex. You're so young we'll, yet. You'll get one as you go. Uh, it's yeah. true. I'm writing it. Um, but we're just going to jump right into it. We're on week four, I believe, of our gauntlet series. I thought it was appropriate to wear a gauntlet to the gauntlet series. Yeah. <laughs> and we're just, we're, I, I just want to kind of jump right into it. So f- right off the bat, what we're going to do is I want you guys to just indulge me for the next few seconds, okay? I, I, I'm up here. You've got to listen to me. You've got to put your <laughs> phones away. Uh, I want you to stop thinking about how it's raining outside, it's not so warm, forget about that. If you missed breakfast this morning, that's a big old you problem. Uh, (laughs) Ignore your rumbling stomach. Don't think about what you're having at lunch today. Just like take a second, uh, this goes for the guys in the booth as well, just take a second and just take a breath. We're just gonna, we're just gonna relax for a sec, okay? We're going to, I also want you guys to just close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to get you guys to imagine something for me, okay? I want you guys, while you're here in this relaxed state, to think back to when you were younger. Younger might have been when you were a new parent. Younger might have been when you were a young adult. Younger maybe when you were a teen. Or even younger when you were a child. Think back to whatever moment in your life that you just went back to. And in that moment, I want you to think of a person that really stood out to you, that really was like a mentor to you or a teacher to you. Who was that one person who invested in you? Who was that one person that changed the trajectory of your life? That person who encouraged you and helped you find your passion, or find your path that you're on today. Now, keeping your eyes closed for just another second, grab that name or grab that face. That person in that memory you're looking at, you don't have to remember their words specifically, but remember how they, me- they made you feel. Remember the joy that they made you feel. Remember maybe some disappointment that you might have had or some encouragement. Remember the gratification that they gave you? That person is important to you in this moment. Okay, you guys can open your eyes now. In Psalm 32, verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Now, when Alex and I were prepping this message over the past couple weeks, uh, I initially wanted to take it in a different direction, and I wrote something, and I gave it to Alex, and he was like, I I think you're looking at this in the wrong way, and he proposed the same question that I just proposed to you guys. 
Who was that one person that really invested in me? And at first, I, I, I came up with two names, and I gave the two names to Alex. And I, they were youth leaders of mine, and they were great. They were, they were awesome in my life. They pulled me out of a dark place, and that was great of them. I have immense respect for, that, for those people. But then I had a chance to kind of just indulge in summertime, in the heat, in a time to have fires and stuff like that. And I had a couple fires in my, in my front yard. Now that we've got this like nice privacy fence built up, we've got a fire pit, it's awesome. And I also had a chance to go out to some friends' cabins and light fires and it was great. It was just a chance for me to relax. And when I was building those fires, it, it really hit me. I was, like, you, you do, like, the typical thing that you do when you build a fire. You cut your kindling, you cut your wood, you cut, get your paper, all that kind of stuff. And as I, like, stacked it into every single fire pit, um, specifically one is a moment that I'm thinking of, and I was stacking it and lighting it, and I was talking to a buddy of mine, and as we lit the fire, and I watched, like, the smoke kind of start, you do that thing where you, like, breathe on the fire. You're like, and you just let the embers, like, burn just kind of flow throughout the pit. And as I'm watching the fire start, I was like, who did this to me? Who lit my fire? Who pushed me to do what I do today? Who might have encouraged me to become an electrician? Who might have encouraged me to become a youth leader? Who started this? Who? And then a name came to me. A face came to me. And... There is, there's certain parts of my life that I, I just don't talk about very often. It's not because I'm ashamed of them or tired of them or upset about them. It's just because I just don't bring them up. I don't know. Ask me about them more. But one of those moments in my life is when I was younger, I was a fighter. And I loved to fight. There was a few times where I fought on the street. We don't talk about that. But specifically, I fought for sport. Uh, I fought in a, in a sport called Kyokushin Karate. And I was in Kyokushin Karate and I loved it. I loved learning. It was, yeah, sure, that was great. I loved the motions and the techniques. Yeah, those were great. Uh, I loved, like, all the stretching you did, sure. Yeah, you know what? But Thursday night, Thursday night was fighting night. And I was all game for that. And this is where I went back to when I was watching that fire that night. Because I remember those fighting nights specifically. Because I had a coach or a sensei that poured his life into me. And I, like, it didn't matter if I went and won tournaments. Like, I won locals, it was great. I won provincials, it was great. I went to nationals and I lost. And, and through every single moment, I, I had this coach to encourage me, to push me. He taught me everything that I use in my life today. He taught me to respect everybody around me. Doesn't matter if they're like an enemy or foe or friend or teammate or anything. He taught me to respect everybody. He taught me to respect the ground that I stand on. He taught me how to compose myself and how to be mentally strong in moments even when I'm terrified. And the reason I thought about this guy was because all of the investment that he poured into me was more than I could ever wish for. He was my teacher as a kid. Even when I believed that I was better than him, he pushed me into places where I would realize my, like, that, oh, I still have a lot to learn. I still have so much room to grow. And yeah. Cool. So... Of course, my phone wants to turn off. I have no idea how long we're going here. One second. Technology saves us so, many, so much time. Okay, so, so one of the reasons that Sheldon and I introduced ourselves the way we did is that we think of this word teacher, and we have this a picture of a, of a classroom. And, uh, and that lecturer who, you know, who's got the 10-point the thing, you know, and, and, and ninthly, you know, that kind of, that kind of teacher. And, uh, and not... That's not exactly what we're talking about. The teacher that we're talking about in this APEST framework that we've been going through in this series is, it could be a bunch of different roles. You can be a teacher, yeah, it could be a theologian, it could be a philosopher, 
but it's more likely going to be a coach. It's going to be that, uh, that person who comes in with your IT department and, and shows you how all, that, how all the all, all stuff works. So the, the teacher is this person who takes the stuff where you're at, where you are, the things that you're doing, and they are able to build you up and to be able to instruct you to keep you going the same dire the right direction. And so, there are many kinds of teachers, but they all draw from the same core gifting and the same core uh, um, desire, same motivation. And especially we're talking about in this now, not just regular teachers, but this Jesus-empowered, apest, this, this thing that we, we grow into in the kingdom, that there's this heart motivation that gets built into the heart of a teacher. And that is to be able to build people up into the thing that they're actually designed to do on the planet. I'm not sure if you've been noticed, but some things in the world aren't going great. Has anyone noticed that some things aren't going great? <laughs> and part of that is because each human has been given an intrinsic gift. Every human is here for a reason and a purpose. There's something in the world that you see a problem that no one else sees properly. And you get to interface in the world in that spot. You get to go and help fix the problems. And so the, everywhere there's a major issue is that there's people who are asleep. There's people who are off task. There are people who are not doing the things they're designed to do in this world. And so the teacher's design is to come in and help direct that person back to their original position, the original thing they're supposed to do, and help build them up in that place. And lots of us, though, we don't have that wake-up call because we've never had that coach come alongside of us because we actually haven't found all of our teachers yet. And so the, the teacher directs and, and amplifies the giftings of everyone else in the church. When the Apostle Paul talks about this, again, he's the apostle, right? He's a, he's a different office. He's the kind of the, the rowdy guy who runs off and starts stuff. And he's talking to a young church leader named Timothy. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good week work. And so, Jesus' teachers, people in this, in this gifting set, they have a knack for being able to dig into Scripture and to be able to pull out truth and be able to pull out uh, ways to encourage us and build us in the church. And they have, a, they have a knack for being able to communicate that to people in ways that are understandable and useful. They're useful for correction, for training and equipping. So one of the main contributors in the New Testament, this guy Paul we just mentioned, he wrote about one-third of the New Testament, and uh, he writes a letter to Corinth, and he's giving them some instruction and giving them some encouragement, and, uh, and he talks about his apostolic ministry, and he compares that to another guy who he worked with who was a teacher. And so it says in 1 Corinthians, he says, I planted, but Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. And then later on he says, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. So he uses this metaphor of, of the you know, organic. He, he planted a seed. He's the apostle. He goes out and does that stuff. But the teacher is the one who comes and he waters and cares for that and brings that, that seed to the, the place where it can grow. It doesn't grow the plant. Like you don't, I can't go outside to my garden and then force my plants to grow, right? God's the one who makes things grow. But you create the environment where you till the soil, you move the stuff, you add the water, you're able to, to steward and garden and shepherd, like all these different metaphors we use, to be able to care for this plant so it grows up to be a healthy, strong plant. And he also talks about how he laid a found, one, I laid a foundation, so he poured the concrete, and another person is building the building on top of it. So that's the second metaphor. And so that, so Apollos is this builder, and but Paul's the guy who, who started the original project to begin with. And so that shows a good contrast between how these gifts function, these different kinds of people. But I think the best example we have in Scripture of a teacher is Jesus. Jesus, over and over and over again in Scripture, is called teacher. So people follow him around, and they, the, the first thing they recognize in him is his teaching gift. And of course, Jesus is the best teacher, because Jesus is actually where all five of these fivefold things come from, this apest model is all given to the church by Jesus. And we, as the body of Christ, we each take a small piece of the gifting of Jesus and we live it out in our lives. And so we together 
work together to become the body of Christ. And so it says in Ephesians, this is the main uh, message or main scripture. You probably hear this every single week as we go through the series. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So Jesus is the ultimate evangelist. Jesus is the ultimate prophet. He's the, the number one apostle. He's the, the good shepherd. He's the pastor who brings his flock together. And he's the ultimate pastor, or ultimate teacher. Sorry, I'm reading ahead of my nose. He literally speaks the words that are life. The whole structure of the church, the whole structure of how we live as Christians is based on the foundation, the bedrock of Jesus' teaching and his life and his way of life. So the heart of the teacher is the heart of Jesus. And we want to help everyone to know him better, to understand how he operates, what he's doing. In the first generations of the church, the church wasn't called the church. It was called the way. Because Christians had a different way of living in the world than the rest of the world did. And as we pattern after Jesus' way of living, his way of doing things, then we actually grow healthy. We actually follow the operating instructions for humanity. We actually live the way that humans are supposed to live. And so as teachers, for those of us who are teachers, we get to come alongside people and help instruct them in the ways of Jesus and how he does things, how he approaches things, how he sees things. The teacher is the stabilizer of the church. It's like a boat has the big keel on the bottom of the boat. If you don't have the keel, if you don't have, you know, fins on your surfboard, then it spins, right? If it has any sort of torque. But then, if you have a nice keel on the boat, when you have pressure coming at it from different angles, it's able to still go in the same direction. It's able to build a, to cut in the direction you want it to go. And so the, the teacher helps stabilize and hold together the other giftings helps the evangelist to go off, do their, their evangelism work, and they don't have to worry about necessarily the same level of, of study and research that would be required to be able, they can, they can actually have a teacher who can come help them with those things. Yeah, so some of us in this room are teachers. Even back earlier when I was speaking, I, like I had you guys imagine, your, imagine a teacher when you were younger at some point in your life. Some of you in this room today are a name or a face that someone thought of. Because some of us in this room are teachers. And if you are a teacher, one thing I honestly want to say to you is you don't need to shove your knowledge, but by grace you need to offer others what they need. Keep that in mind. You don't need to shove your knowledge down their throat. Sometimes they don't need to know everything that you know. Teachers equip. They make tools. They give tools. Sometimes they're tools like what Alex makes. Yeah. He's a blacksmith. He makes tools sometimes. He also makes other fancy things, but he makes tools and he gives tools to people. That's what teachers do. Unhealthy teachers build themselves up. They use their knowledge against others. That's that part where I said don't shove your knowledge down other people's throat. Unhealthy teachers will use their knowledge against others. They will make others into themselves. They will equip everyone as if everyone should be a teacher and the same kind of teacher that they are. There doesn't need to be two of me. There doesn't need to be two of Alex. No. And if you're a teacher, there doesn't need to be two of you. There hardly needs to be one of Alex, so. <laughs> Sarah agrees. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but healthy teachers or wise teachers, they equip people for their own individual call. They equip them for their own purpose or their own identity. Sometimes the people, they won't fully agree with what you have to give to them or what you're offering to them or what even God has offered to them. They just, but we are called to give them what they need, what we have prayed about and what we feel like they need. Now, having Alex and I up here, this has been a pretty serious talk so far, 
And you can't bring two nerds up on stage without bringing some sort of fandom into it. Um, <laughs> so we're I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a geek, not a nerd. There's a difference. <sighs> <laughs> Should we start a debate? Like <laughs> <laughs> later. That's what, yeah. um, but so we actually have a, a video clip for you guys today, and I'm not even going to explain it before we get into it. I'm going to talk about it after, so we'll just dive right in to that. My gift for you, Legolas is a bow of the Galadrim, worthy of the skill of our woodland kin. These are the daggers of the Noldorim. They have already seen service in war. Do not fear, young Peregrine Took. You will find your courage. And for you, Samwise Gamgee, elven rope made of heath lime. Thank you, my lady. Have you run out of those nice shiny daggers? And what gift would a dwarf ask of the elves? Nothing. Except to look upon the lady of the Galadrim one last time. For she is more fair than all the jewels beneath the earth. <laughs> Actually, uh, there was one thing. Uh, uh, no, 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 I'm talking nonsense. It's quite impossible. It's stupid. I have nothing greater to give than the gift you already bear. A melethdin. The antiquil Arwen and Domiel. Figitha. Ani doni e broniatha. Ara e periatha. Atali mesi de damare. Ani do. E kiratha. Namalami. That choice is yet before her. You have your own choice to make, Aragorn. To rise above the height of all your fathers since the days of Elendil. Or to fall into darkness with all that is left of your kin. Namaria. So if you guys didn't know, that was Lord of the Rings. Uh, the Fellowship <laughs> of the Ring. If you guys don't know, check them out. There, we were talking about it earlier, how there's like three really great movies, but there's also extended versions yep. if you really want to throw away a day. Um, a whole day, the whole thing. Yeah. Whole day. So we, we thought, or Alex thought about this clip because it is a perfect representation of what a teacher's life can be like. Sometimes you, you are going to present information to people and they love it. They love every bit of it. Like the first guy he gave a, she gave a bow to and he's like admiring it and he's like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> and the next few guys, they give them knives and they're like, like there's a scary term to it. Like, oh, these have already seen war, but don't worry. And they're like, sweet. And then the next guy, she gives uh, the robe to. And he's like, oh, this is pretty cool. Can I get one of those? <laughs> and then the next guy comes along and it's like, well, what do you want? Oh, I don't want anything from you. It's all good. I mean, I mean, yeah, you could give me this. And then some people, you just, you won't have anything to give to them because you might just not be the teacher for that person. That is a perfect representation of exactly what it's like. As we've been talking up here, we've been talking about a teaching heart, though. It is the heart of helping keep people on path, like Alex said, and not to get all screwed up on other paths. We have to remember who the teachers are in our lives and what it looks like. God... In reality, the ultimate teacher in our life, even amongst all of the teachers in this room, the ultimate teacher is God. God doesn't forget. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't hate us. He doesn't forget about us. He doesn't like, just diminish us if we miss a day or we miss an hour or we miss a couple of weeks. 
He loves us. He adores us. And if you're a teacher, this is where you need to be. You need to adore people. You start there and you go from there. If you teach out of hate or anger, that's what you'll teach. That's what you'll continue. But if you teach out of love and you teach out of passion and you teach from your heart, that is where your lessons will go. Now we've kind of said over and over again that there's, there's teachers in this room. You might be a teacher. And there's others. You've got different giftings. And that's great. We're all part of this church. We all help the church in our own way. If you're not a teacher, that's, don't think that you can always just teach yourself. Re read the Bible. That's great. But find yourself a teacher as well. Find someone who can speak into your life, who can mentor your life. When I started this at the beginning, I had you guys think of a teacher in your life and made you, or uh, tried to help you guys imagine how that teacher made you feel in your heart, the feelings you had, the disappointment, the encouragement, all that kind of stuff. If you're a teacher, make sure you're projecting that. If, you don't, if you're not a teacher, make sure you're finding somebody who can do that for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5-6, through 6, it says there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings. But in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So ultimately, where is your tool? Where do you get your tool from? Where do you come from? Where are you a teacher? Are you a pastor? Are you an evangelist? Are you a prophetic? I always forget the fifth. Are you an apostle? Thank you, Clay. <laughs> Where do you guys get your tool from? Who equips you? Or who do you equip? Mm -hmm. So Jesus has this famous prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And one of the very first things he, he talks about, how great God is. And then immediately the next thing he says is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Like I said before, the earth isn't quite like heaven right now. And some of us, are, we have places where we're already put that we're able to help fix things and make them more like, like heaven is, like God's future kingdom will be. So are there sick people in heaven? No. So then maybe the people here who are gifted in healing or in, like they're, maybe you're a nurse or a doctor or maybe you're a social worker and you're dealing with mental health. How much more impact could you have if you had a Jesus-centered coach who could help you, guide you in kingdom principles, not just in the profession that you have, but also in kingdom life and how it functions and where it goes. Maybe you're into the environment and you want to be able to see trees grow healthy and you want to have, you know, reverse pollution. Is there, is there pollution in the future kingdom? No. No. Is, does God have a problem with disease encroaching on plants? And no, no. No. So how do we find the Jesus people to help actually find the regular parts of our life, not just the church stuff, but these Jesus people who can come in and then fill your life and, and, and build you up in the ways of the things you already do in your regular life because all things are spiritual. Everything we do is a part of God's original plan. Everything we do is part of the world as it functions. And so maybe you're just a salesman, but can you actually be a salesman for the glory of God? Can you actually, instead of trying to think of the bottom line of your company, maybe think, this person is a person who needs a touch from somebody who's compassionate and loving, and how can we learn to be those people and have a good coach to help guide us in those things? Any sports enthusiasts here today? Any sport people? Uh, what happens when you get a team full of, of good players with a horrible coach? It just falls apart. It doesn't matter how many star players you hire. You can, still have a, you can still tank your team if your coach doesn't know how to coach those players. Like, you can take a team of the most oddball people and throw them together, but you give them a good coach, like that great classic 1992 movie, The Mighty Ducks. Anybody remember that movie? <laughs> if you have Emilio Estevez coaching your team, you can have all the B-team players and bring them together and find those Magical things that each person has, every gift that they, they possess, all the things that they are special about them, 
and emphasize those things, then you can win championships. So imagine, dream with me for a moment. What if everyone in here had a coach? What if we all had somebody who invested in us in that way? What if we could find all the teachers? What if we could pair them appropriately with the people in this room so that the things that we do carry kingdom significance? So we're no longer just people working jobs and then coming and doing church on the weekends. But what if we could live that kingdom life every day? What would it look like if this church could actually work in this community in a way that brought life in every communication and every interaction that we have? A guide to show us how to get there. What if we had a Mr. Miyagi to be, teach us our spiritual karate? Wouldn't this city be changed if just this group of people in here were fully empowered to do the things that God has called them to do? What if we were really able to love our neighbors like God intended us for to do, like Jesus calls us to do? So whatever it is you're called to do, whether it's sell shoes or care for the environment, maybe you manage people in your business, how do you actually take that and empower it in a Jesus way? See, Jesus was one guy, and he came, and he took 12 guys, and he spent three years with them, investing his life in them. And then at the end of Jesus' ministry, there was about 120 people we could call in the church. So he had the 12, and then he has this 120. And then within a generation, we have a third of the Roman Empire being Christians. Within a few generations, we have a third of the earth being Christians. Like this one guy and his teaching gift and his ability to be able to spread this idea, this way of Jesus, and the people that he empowered to do it changed more lives than any other person in all of history. We literally set our clocks by, like our, the, our, our, our calendar by the advent of Jesus, him showing up on the scene. And what if we could take just a piece of that thing that God has called you to do in your life, just a, just a, just a piece of it, and live it out the way he, is, he wants you to do it, and empowered in the way he wants you to do it, with a coach to be able to help guide you and correct you and bring you into that place where you can do that. Can you imagine what this city would be like? So that's my challenge. That's our, that's our hope for you. Is that if you're a teacher, do your research, spend your time in the Bible, iron sharpens iron, so find another teacher to be able to debate with. Theology is always best done in community, so don't just go it alone. Find other people and debate and work it through. And then find those people who match your, your call, the things that you feel about the world. Find each other. And how do we then empower them in the things that we've learned to teach them to be the best them they can be and not just reproduce yourself? So that's, our, that's, our, that's my prayer for you this morning. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to bless you guys, and we're going to release you. So thank you, Jesus, that you sent these five giftings, these, these five amazing kinds of people into your church to be able to build us up, to be able to call us, to be able to, to send us, to be able to do all these amazing things that you want us to do in this world, to be a light to this world, to live this world out in full health. So I pray that you would call us and build us today. I pray that the, those who are the teachers in this room, that they'd feel that in their, in their heart, in their soul, that they'd know that that's the, the place that you have for them, and that they'd learn how to take the next steps. They'd discover other teachers and be able to work together to be able to amplify their, their giftings with each other, and they'd be able to find those people to mentor, to coach, to steward, to encourage. And I pray that this church would be the kind of place that every interaction with these people would become a Jesus interaction that they'd find places of, of, to, to just plant seeds and, and water and add life everywhere they go. I pray that this church would be the kind of place that impacts the, whole, the very soul of this community. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.